in this, this holy week, uh, as we call it, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot that goes on. In, in a seven-day period, we have an unbelievable amount of events and information and words, words and text. We start off last Sunday with what we call Palm Sunday. It's this, this Jesus returning to Jerusalem. Jesus has come in and out of Jerusalem before. This isn't his first time coming. But he knows that this time is going to be different. He knows this arrival in Jerusalem will be his last arrival in Jerusalem in the way that it's been up until this point. And so, you know, early on in his ministry, he'll heal people and he'll, he'll, he'll interact with demons who recognize him, and, which is always fascinating because nobody really gets who Jesus is. Uh, even his disciples uh, struggle and wrestle with who Jesus is, but every time Jesus uh, interacts with a demon, they know exactly who he is and what's going on. And early on in his ministry, he even tells them, like, you know, shut your mouth, don't go tell anybody, go on somewhere. And that question comes up all the time, like, why on earth would Jesus do miraculous things and then tell people not to share? And the, the answer I kind of give, usually, is that he, knew that he knew that his words, he knew that his miracles would lead him to being put to death. He knew that the people in power would see this as a threat and would put him to death. And while he knew that was the end, he wasn't ready yet. He had a lot to do. He had a lot to train. He had a lot to disciple. He had a lot to teach. He had a lot to demonstrate, and he wasn't ready. Until he comes in to Jerusalem this time on Sunday, there's a huge shift, and now we recognize Jesus, Jesus is ready. Jesus takes the gloves off. Uh, there's no, you know, don't go tell. Monday and Tuesday are what, you know, my, my youth group kids have always dubbed, you know, sassy Jesus. Like, Jesus comes in, he takes the gloves off, and you, you really see a much more direct and, and in your face to a lot of the Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests and elders of who and what Jesus is. Wednesday, we have this, this kind of small period of almost where time and space just stand still, this tipping point for the week. We have this beautiful time with Mary. Um, we know that the backstory, we know Judas at that exact same moment is going and entering into this contract to betray Jesus. Thursday, which is often called Maundy Thursday, it just means command, and, and it's this idea that in the midst of all of this, Jesus sits at this table. Jesus sits at this table with disciples, with friends, with family, and, and he shares a cup and he shares a meal. And, and, and we don't have time to get into it, but we've talked about it some before, the, the importance and the impact of sharing a meal with someone. And Jesus shared a meal. And not only that, but Jesus, the master got down on hands and knees and he washed feet. He washed dirty, nasty, stinky, animal-soiled feet. And not just the ones he chose, not just the ones that he decided were worthy, not just his, his inner three, but everybody's. Judas is in this room. Judas is at this table. And as, I've seen this posted before, and, and it really is an interesting thing. You know, we, we talk about all the time we play these games, and we talk about, okay, if you, had, if you knew for a fact you had one day left to live, what would you do? And all the answers are crazy, right? Like, I'd go, um, I'd blow all my money. I'd go to Disney World. I'd, you know, go on the one-day dream vacation I would always want to. I'd, you know, go do all these crazy things. Jesus knew he had one day left to live, and he washed feet. He washed stinky, nasty, dirty feet of unworthy people who were going to betray him. And I'm not just talking about Judas. Judas gets the rap. Judas betrayed him. Judas, Judas took the money and was used to betray Jesus. But so did the rest of them. 
the disciples scattered. Those 12 guys, 11 after Judas, because Judas, you know, Judas threw the money back after Jesus got arrested. And, and Judas literally went and hung himself out of, out of the depth of grief for what he had done. The 11 left scattered. Peter, Peter hung out a little while. Peter stayed as long as he could. And then Peter, in staying and chasing and swinging swords and everything else, denies Jesus three times. Betrayal, betrayal, betrayal. And Jesus washed their feet, all of their feet. Made no bones about it. He didn't pick and choose. He didn't make scathing remarks as he washed their feet. He didn't even talk about the betrayal. He talked about the betrayal at some point in the meal, but it wasn't in the washing of the feet. Then Friday, lots transpires, pages and pages and pages. Uh, Wednesday has very little, uh, uh, very little print dedicated to it. Saturday has the least. Friday's got a lot. Friday's got a lot. We, we, we see Jesus come in and, and this, this kind of fake trial, and, and Pilate, the, the politician, he, he's fully aware this is a fake trial, and he's, he, he tries repeatedly to let Jesus go. Pilate, then he concocts a plan that he knows will get Jesus off, and it still doesn't, and that's when he really knows this thing has jumped the ship. And so uh, Pilate, you know, washes his hands in front of everybody. He's like, I'm out. Jesus gets carried to the cross. He gets to the cross, he, he's nailed to the cross, and he dies. The soldiers check him, they pierce his side, he's dead. They take him down, they put him in a tomb, they bury him. And then there's Saturday, and Saturday, everything is lost here. Here in life under the sun that we've been talking about, it's all lost. I, I really believe, and, and, and yes, this is you know, from the book of Levi's Opinions, but I, I don't think a single one of these disciples held much hope out on Saturday. I think the disciples thought their world was over. And I'm talking about all of them. I, I mean, I believe that uh, all of them, the, 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 the 12, the 3, the men, the women, the followers, all of them, I think they thought... How did we get something this wrong? How did we miss it? Like, we, we saw the signs, so what did we miss? How, how can this be? How can this be? And so, Saturday is just darkness and depression and isolation. I mean, they're hiding. They're in, they're, they've padlocked the doors. They've locked themselves in. They're hiding. You know, the, the shades are drawn. The candles are blown out. Like, they're in hiding. It's the one full day, start to finish, that Jesus' body lies dead in a tomb. And if that's the end of the story... We've got nothing. And honestly, it's not like if that's the end of the story, then we, um, you know, are, are living for nothing. If that was the end of the story, I, we wouldn't be here. This building wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here in this ministry. There wouldn't be ministry. There wouldn't be Christianity. This wouldn't exist. If that was the end of the story, this story would have never gotten out of the first century. It would have never gotten out of that week because there's nothing special about somebody getting killed on a cross. Honestly, there wasn't anything too unique about someone claiming to be the Messiah dying and being killed. But what makes this story get out of the first century, what makes this story last all this time, what makes this story create the very timeline that we mark our lives by when we write our checks when we write our dates on a calendar the the very event that we mark time by is because of sunday morning sunday morning is what makes us exist it's what gets us up in the morning. It's what gives us purpose to live. It's what gives us the 
gift to have the ability to be in a right relationship with God. From the beginning, from creation to completion, the story is about redemption. Always has been, always will be. Creation to completion, it is all about redemption. And this is where it came to fruition. The day the revolution began was the day that Jesus came out of the tomb. And the tomb was left empty. And now another crucified Messiah wasn't. Wasn't. For every ounce of celebratory effort we put into Christmas, we should have 10 million pounds of celebratory effort put into Easter because Easter is what makes Christmas exist or even matter. Sunday morning, the women go to the tomb, Mary and Mary, and it's always confusing because, you know, at that day and time, everyone, every, every woman was, every third woman was named Mary and like every fifth guy was named James and, and we try to make it really confusing. But Mary and Mary and some others and Salome and a few others and about a half a dozen women go to the tomb. And they go there and read this. Read these accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all four of them record this. All four. There, there are some things that are in, in, in pieces. Some of them that are just in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in John and, and vice versa. And this one is all of them. Uh, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20 and 21. They go to the tomb. And they get there. And this, 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 this thing appears, robed in lightning, it says. They didn't have words to describe it. And, and I love that what we see happens is, is the, the, you know, the SEAL Team 6, the Roman guard that is stationed there, you know, guarding this tomb to make sure that the disciples don't come steal the body, pass out. They faint. They're done. They're, they're completely terrified, and they pass out, and they faint. And after they faint, then, the, <laughs> then they turn to the women who did not faint and say, don't be afraid, you who are still conscious. But the guy you're looking for is not here. He's not here. I love, I love, I, I love the, like, the low-key sarcasm there. Like, what are, you, what are you doing here? Who are you looking for? He said he wasn't going to be here. And my favorite piece that I shared, I don't remember if it was last Sunday or if it was in one of the videos, is Mary. Uh, it says that Jesus appears and calls out, says, uh, hey, what are, you, what are you doing here? Mary's kind of walking away. She's distraught, so they've, they've taken him. Not that he's been raised, but even Mary. You know, Mary, Mary's group, the, 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 the Jews that were following Jesus, they were supposed to be the ones who were going to come in, you know, these radicals and uh, overthrow the Roman guard and you know, roll away the stone and steal the body so that they could concoct the story. But she, who would have been in that group thinks the same thing because she has no other explanation because they don't get it. And she's like, man, he's, somebody took him. Somebody took him, and she's still walking. And he's, he's addressed her. He's called her. He, he said, hey, woman, she's still walking. Uh, but then, then he says it. He says, Mary. Oh, and she gets it. Then she turns. Then she turns and she grabs him because that's a voice she knows. Nobody said her name like that. Nobody else. That was her shepherd. She knew the voice of her shepherd. She knew the sound of her name coming from his mouth and she heard it. And she turns and she weeps and she grabs him, just grabs him. 
And I love that she's grabbing him so hard in such a clutch that he's got to say, like, you can't hold me here forever. Like, I got, I got stuff I got to do. I'm not done yet. But go and tell. Ah, this group of women were given the first commission to go and tell. Go tell. Go tell everybody. Go tell my followers. Tell the groups that were with me. Go tell my disciples. And go tell Peter. Go tell him too. Jesus in this moment. Jesus has returned to life. Jesus has actually defeated death. Returned to life. And is here for all of humanity past, present, and future, billions and billions of people. And in this moment, he still calls out the one he still calls. Go tell Peter too. Man, I know Peter has just beat himself to death over what he did. Go tell him too. Let him know that I singled him out. Go tell Peter. I love that so much because it gives me so much hope. It gives me so much hope that there are the mornings that, that God, you know, God gets up and uh, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to go tell Highland View and I'm going to go tell Levi too. I'm going to go tell Highland View and I, I'm going to go tell this other one. I'm going to go tell that person who came that one time who sat in the back and decided that Oh, these, these people must have got it figured out, but not me. I'm going to go tell that one. I'm, I'm here for billions of people, but there was this one girl who decided that she had just gone too far for me to care, so I'm, I'm going to go chase that one today. Go tell Peter. The women take the message. Another reason of the beauty of this story, because listen, women weren't paid attention to then. We do a terrible job paying attention to women now, but we certainly did a terrible job then. And if we were going to make this up, if the disciples were going to make this up, if first century churches or first century politicians were going to make this story up, I promise you the first witnesses to the resurrection and the first ones to go tell about the resurrection would not have been a group of women. It would have been a group of prominent men who were believable. Don't believe me. Just see what the story goes next. This group of women who had been with the disciples and had been with Jesus for three years following around and it says ministering to Jesus goes and tell the disciples the disciples are like freaking women (laughs) says they thought it was idle story like just like chill out that'd be nice okay thanks oh Jesus is undeterred I love this too what Jesus Jesus coming back at that moment and Jesus being here now is not dependent on any of our ability to believe it. Jesus was undeterred. Jesus shows up. He shows up anyway. He shows up uninvited all the time. He showed up uninvited into that locked room. He showed up on that shore with them out on the boat when they had gone back to work because they didn't know what the heck else they were going to do. Like, my life is over. I dedicated my life to this, and it's gone. I guess I'll go back to fishing. Jesus shows up there, and he calls to them. Uh, And on that boat, there's this crazy guy on the shore being a smart aleck, calling out to the professional fishermen, telling them how to fish. And then it works. And then Peter knows the voice. Peter knows his shepherd's voice, and he jumps out of the boat again, just like he did the time before. And he swims in, naked, swims into shore, because he can't even wait for the boat to get turned around, because he knows his shepherd's voice, and he's got to get there now. Peter, who had been beating himself up, who had betrayed Jesus, who had denied Jesus over and over again, who had then run and hid and locked himself away and then went and went back to work, 
had beat himself up so bad that Jesus knew it and said, go tell Peter too. When he still heard Jesus' voice, he couldn't wait to get to him. Because as bad as he had beat himself up, he still knew Jesus. And he knew if I can just get to him, if I can just touch the hem of his robe, if I can just lay at his feet, if I can just be near him, it will all be fine. Nothing else will matter. Peter knew I've ruined everything, but if I can get to him, I don't face judgment. I get Jesus. And so he couldn't run fast enough. He couldn't swim fast enough. He couldn't fall fast enough to get to the feet of Jesus because as a a sinner and as a betrayer and as an abandoner still the safest place was at the feet of Jesus that's who Jesus is that's who came out of that tomb not judgment grace and peace and mercy and choice We can choose not to, of course. That's the amazing thing. Even Jesus, it said Jesus came back out of the grave alive and went and met with people. And they saw him and they knew it was him. And it says, and still some looking at him did not believe. We still got a choice. God doesn't want puppets. Puppets are no good. He could have made puppets. He made us instead. We're hard-headed and hard-hearted. He said it from the beginning. If he wanted puppets, he could have made it. He didn't. So we get to choose, but we get to choose. And he wants us to know from the beginning that the character of God is a God that chases and pursues and goes after. Chases and pursues and goes after. You can't run far enough. You can't run fast enough. You you can't do horrible enough for God to stop chasing. For God to stop reaching out a hand. For God to stop genuinely wanting you to just come home and be at the feet of Jesus. Because there's no place like it what we have what we have is a savior we have a savior who saves the broken and the lost and the hard headed and the hard hearted We have a Savior who chases the runners. And guys, I can run pretty fast. (laughs) And I can run pretty far. And I can run pretty hard. And I've tried a lot. And I still do. I might take off running tomorrow morning. But as David said, where am I going to go? Where am I going to (laughs) go? I stand still and you're here. I I look up and you're there. I run to Sheol. I, I, I know this place, the depths of depravity, the place that is the furthest from the presence of God. You're not even supposed to get to be there, God. So I go there to hide and you're still there. Because there's no place I can go. There's no place you can go. There's no place you can run where God stops chasing. You can never stop running. But here's what I need you to hear. No matter how far or how fast or how hard you run, you're never further away from God. Hear that again. No matter how far or how fast or how hard you run, you're never any further away from God. 
God constantly chases and pursues. And so you can run and you can decide to literally never look back. You can decide, I've made a choice. I don't don't want God. I don't care how hard he runs. I don't care how, how far he pursues. I don't want him. And you can never look back. And God will honor that choice. God gives us that choice. But if you run two feet away, when you turn around, God is right there in your face waiting. Arms open wide. It's the prodigal son. God doesn't wait for you to come and and fall prostrate. God didn't even wait in the story. God didn't even wait for the the prodigal son to present his his plan of redemption. God's like, nope, I did that. You, you You don't get to plan redemption. I already did it. So he ran out and met him, didn't even give him a chance to speak, didn't even let him apologize, just grabbed him up. If you run 10,000 miles, as soon as you turn, God is right there in your face. Because you can't ever be any further away from God. You can never turn around, but you can't get further away. God doesn't wait for you to get things right. God doesn't wait for you to figure things out. God doesn't wait for you to fall prostrate and give him your 12-step program about how you're going to be worthy for God. God's like, nope, sorry, I've already done it. I did the work. It's about my character, not yours. That's what came out of the grave. It is because he lives that all of this is possible. It is because he lives that all of this is real. It's because he lives that we are constantly pursued and that God, like he called Mary, like he called Peter, is calling us to the safest place at the feet of Jesus. Just come home. Just come home. Pray with me. God, we are <laughs> we are unfathomably blessed. Uh, we, we, we don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get it any more than Peter did. We don't get it any more than uh, Mary did. We don't get it any more than Thomas did. We don't get it any more than Judas did. We, we don't get it. But the only thing is, is it's, it's not about us. It's not about my character. It's not about my ability. It's not about my worthiness. It's, it's not about who I am. It's not even about who I can become. It's about you, who you are, who you have always been, who you will always be. It is about your character and not mine God we thank you that we serve a God who asks for mercy and not sacrifice a God who the only sacrifice that was important was the one that you gave your sacrifice for us so that we could just come home Thank you for this family. I am so unbelievably grateful for this family and grateful beyond measure that I get to be a part of it. God, we pray for the hurting who you want to heal. We pray for the broken who you just want to hold. We pray for the lost and the lonely who you just want to recognize that they're not any further away from you now than they ever were at any other point in their life because their running doesn't cover any distance from you. We think we have run miles and we have run screaming and cussing and crying on a treadmill with you standing behind it just waiting for us to hit the stop button and turn around for a second. 
Thank you for being the God who pursues. Thank you for being the God who calls out to the one. Thank you for being the God who calls Mary by name and who says, go tell my disciples, go tell the billions of people of the world, oh, and go tell Peter. Because it's because you live. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Maybe that's it. I don't know if that's the words or not, but it's got to be close. Because he lives, even though I have been furloughed from work, I'm not afraid. I have a, a piece that doesn't make any sense. That's what his life has made a difference in me. He's changed who I am, and he's changed my future, and I don't have to be afraid anymore. Hello, my name is John Moore. I'd just like to share a little bit of insight with you about the reason I live today for Christ. It's such a joy to have him as my Lord and Savior. There were times in my life where I struggled of who I am and what I am, but now that he's my refuge, he's my savior, he's my provider, he's my comforter, I don't struggle like I used to, but Jesus went to the cross for me and he made my life a whole lot better than what it was. And even still today, I still struggle because I'm human, I have failures, I have setbacks, I have shortcomings, I don't like who they are, but it's a joy to know that I can go to him with no matter what problem they are. And he can and will provide for me a comfort there and a relief. So thankful for you going to the cross, Jesus. I'm so thankful that you gave your life for me, that I can have life much better than what it used to be. Without him, my life would be hopeless. I'm nothing. Thank you for Christ and his love and his salvation. Because he lives, I live. And I have an example of what love, grace, and forgiveness should look like, even when I feel like someone doesn't deserve it. Because he lives, he has given me many gifts. I survived a childhood illness of three years, and he gave me the gift of patience. At 16, I taught my first Bible class, and he gave me the gift of teaching. When I was 23, I had my first baby, and I nearly died. But because he lives, he gave me the gift of motherhood. And my child was very sick, a near-fatal epilepsy. But he didn't die, so I'm still mama. After a very scary marriage ended, I had to get a job, and he gave me the gift of technology and even leadership. So today, now that I was disabled at age 55, I use all those gifts. I'm a mama, I'm patient, I teach, and I still use technology because he lives. Easter is a special time, but this year it's really different. It's harder. Um, 
But even though it's harder, I can continue to love my wife and my kids. I can continue to take care of my employees like they're part of my family. I can um, keep running hard after all the leads that I can find to keep my business going. I can ultimately, in a lot of situations, have less money than I'm used to having and be okay. I can lose sleep. I can help bear the burden for family members and friends that are sick. Um, I can most of the time keep a smile on my face. <laughs> um, and that's because I know it gets better. It's because I know I'm not alone. And all of that is because I know he lives. Because he lives, I am still here today. I was in a really bad car accident when I was 16 years old. Um, that should have taken my life, but he had bigger plans for me. So I went on to donate my kidney to my cousin, which um, had a helping hand in saving her life. So he had a bigger plan for me, and that's how I know he lives. One of our favorite songs is Because He Lives. The first line in the chorus is Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. And like through this virus that we're going through, it really helps to know that no matter what happens, because he lives, we'll get through it. Life is the same way. You have hills and valleys along the way you have loss of parents, you have car wrecks, you have diseases that won't go away. And because God's always there and you have the assurance that he'll always be there, it makes living a whole lot different than if you don't have him. He's one of the most wonderful, secure things that we have in life. And we need to always remember that no matter how bad things get or even how good they get. He's always there. And because he lives, we're always safe and secure. It's good to have that kind of confidence that we uh, know that no matter what comes our way, with Jesus, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, because he lives, my sins are forgiven and I am covered by the blood of Christ from Calvary. I don't have to understand what takes place in this life to know that through faith that God is holy and just, that through God's word I am in his presence daily and armed for battle in this life, that I have hope and promise of a better life and a better place in heaven with God and Christ my Savior, that I have been given the greatest gift that God could give by Christ taking on and paying for my debt, a debt that he did not owe, that my self-worth is not tied to physical objects, but to the heavenly ones, that by loving and serving God that I will love and serve my fellow man, not because that I have to, but because God's love fills me, that when I leave this life, that God has prepared a place so beautiful that my mind cannot comprehend it, that someday that Christ will return and all those in the grave will hear his voice and those of us who are left will be called to meet with him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All these because he lives. When Jesus was crucified and died, his disciples and followers were heartbroken. Imagine those Gospels if that's where the story ended. We would read the story of a good man who taught all to love their neighbor and love God. We would have read about the terrible beatings, torture, and finally death of a good man who never did one single thing wrong. We would tear up reading the heartache that those Gospel writers experienced. We would close our Bible, shake our head at how bad the world was and still is. 
our faith and hope would be weak. But thankfully, the Gospels didn't end there. Jesus defeated death, assuring us we can too, that we can one day join him in a place that he's preparing for us. He came and he took on our sin and the punishment of it that we deserve, and he still invites us to one day join him. We have hope and it strengthens our faith that the story of Jesus' death didn't end in death because he lives. Hi everyone. Uh, during this crazy time, I don't know what all is going to happen in in my life and what's going to you know happen in in my family's life. I know what that's happened in my first 54 years. Um, but the one thing that uh, gives me great comfort is to know that I know how the story ends, and that's in heaven, and that's all because he lives. Because he lives, I have hope. I have hope of a heavenly home that he has prepared for me, where we will live with him forever. This promise gives me less fear and less worry when I think about it. I say less because sometimes I can still be a big worry wart. Circumstances come up that I can't explain. Situations happen that I don't understand. But what I do know is that he said he would always be with me. He holds the future in his hands and he is in control. And when I think on the promise of the home that he has prepared for me in heaven, that gives me hope. So I'm walking around my yard in this uh, COVID-free environment, or at least I'd like to hope that's what it is. And I'm thinking about what my life is like knowing that God and Jesus live, how it's made me different. The first thing that comes to mind is because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know the future because Life is living just because he lives. I don't know the words to that song, obviously. <laughs> I guess I need to learn them. But uh, the difference for me is because he lives, I know that all of this stuff really doesn't matter. It's vapor, as we've learned about, as Levi's told us repeatedly the last few weeks. Vapor, vapor, vapor. This will be gone. Uh, it's a matter of time. This will be taken care of. If God wants me to come home... I'm going home, brothers and sisters, and I'll make no bones about it. I mean, uh, I'm not worried about getting a disease that's going to kill me, though I'm not exactly going to run out to Walmart and start hugging every person inside the local Walmart store either. I'll be a little bit smarter about it than that. But I am confident about where I'm headed when this life is over because he lives. I have a piece about myself that I used to not have. Yes, I still have human responses, but I always know that he is wrapping his arms around me at all times, even when I don't even when I think I can't do it anymore. And that's all because he lives. Amen. Um, because he lives, I am able to just um, have a lot less anxiety and a lot less worry about things that are unimportant. And when I do worry, when I do have anxiety, you know, I have that assurance that um, in the end, everything's going to be okay. I get to live with him forever. And um, it's just amazing to be able to like rest in that fact, even during times when I'm really unsure about everything. And it's all because he lives. From the beginning, 
God created order out of chaos. And Jesus continues that for us today. The teachings of Jesus, the family of faith that we have in Jesus, gives us a peace because we walk through life with others. I'm reminded of the song that we sing, Because He Lives. And it talks about from a child's birth, how, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face in certain days because he lives. We can't control what goes on in our lives, but we have a peace that passes understanding through Jesus and through the faith that we see in our family of faith. The third verse of that song, Because He Lives, talks about passing from this life. I and several others, I know Kevin Stroop went through this with his dad, have watched our parents who have lived lives of faith in Jesus. The minute that they pass from this life to spending eternity in his arms. There's a comfort in that. That's something, that's a legacy that we need to pass down to our kids is to see how Jesus gives us hope gives us confidence, gives us faith, and gives us peace. I love you, Highland View. Look forward to being back with you because he lives. God risen from the grave and he lived again. So he didn't want me because he didn't want me to be scared of my scary dreams and be scared of the dark. And because he lives, I can have hope in my future with him. I can um, not live with my shame or guilt. Know that I am loved beyond measure. And um, he is never mad at me for my wrongs. <laughs> What makes me, what makes us different is that no matter how bad things get, no matter how uncertain or fearful things get, we have hope, we have assurance. As Paul says in Romans, in all these things we are more than conquerors. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, because he lives. Because he lives, I don't get what I deserve, but I get his beautiful gift of grace instead. All of my guilt and my shame that weighs me down while I'm here on earth and sometimes prevents me from having the abundant and free and full life that Jesus has promised to me, I just get in my own way. But when he rolls my stone away and he calls me out of my grave, that is my hope of freedom because he lives.